Hello everybody, my name is Ratnos, welcome to my Mythic Answerek guide. It's gonna be a long one, use the chapters as you need to go to the different sections. We're gonna stop and we're gonna talk about everything as it happens though. Um, so first off, we have the tank mechanics on this fight. Now depending on your tank composition in P1, uh, you may want to set up a different configuration, but with what we had, which was Druid DK, uh, it made the most sense for all of the liquefies to go on me, the Druid, and all the feasts to go on the DK, because the Druid wants to shift out of bear form to break the web blade or the, the roots on this fight. Uh, and that's something that you don't want to do while you're tanking the boss. And whoever gets the feast is going to be tanking the boss uh, for pretty much the entirety of this phase. And then whoever's taking the liquefies just is taunting the boss. Now, there are three sets of this tank combo throughout the fight. You can swap and have different tanks take the different ones. But the basic idea is going to be the liquefy is just a big initial hit, and then it leaves a dot. Uh, and that dot makes you very vulnerable to physical damage, so you can't take the boss after that. And the feast is a massive heal absorb that is reduced the more you can mitigate the initial hit. Uh, and then you need to get out of that healing absorb before you die and you're tanking the boss uh, from then on. So we used stuff like time dilation is really good on that initial hit. Um, Guardian Spirit. Uh, so externals like that can go on your tank on these feasts. Uh, they also, Vamp Blood is really good against it. Uh, health Pot, Health Stone, Lay on Hands, those kind of effects to get them out of the feast. It's not the end of the world. All the tanks can deal with it, but uh, stuff like Brewmaster, for instance, if you're playing one of those, really good at taking the feast, uh, can be excellent for that. Uh, okay, so that's what we did for the tank mechanics for this whole fight. So for the overwhelming majority of the fight, uh, the boss was being moved by Snap in this phase, uh, and not me. So uh, we moved the boss to the edge of the room over here. Now, the... The reason we start over here, the entrance actually is over behind and to the left, like the, um, the, the, the bridge to get into the room is behind us and to the left. So this is the kind of spoke of the hexagon, one to the right of that. And this is so that we end the intermission in the right spot uh, so that we can then split up to our P2 sides uh, from kind of the middle of, the, of between the two of them. And also this is good for like shadow stepping the boss or something, not being a problem in the intermission, something like that too, uh, something like that. So uh, this is where pretty much everybody will start this fight. Uh, and yeah, we just drag the boss as far as we can into the corner, uh, does the first liquefy there. Everybody kind of baits these puddles so that they aren't ahead of the boss, ideally. Uh, and then we move uh, ahead of the boss. Okay, first mechanic that's going to come out now is the uh, the roots. Now, these roots are going to affect everybody in the raid. They're going to put a big silken tomb on you. This thing has a bunch of health as well. It got nerfed, but it is still a very heavy amount of, uh, of health, which, by the way, any nerfs that come to this boss after this guide comes out, I'll put a pinned comment that tries to mention like what you should do about them. Uh, but for this mechanic... We had a plan for dealing with each of the roots. So there are four roots, and some classes can just deal with these uh, very, very easily, right? Um, so, like, DK can just alternate AMS and Wraithwalk. Druid can just shift everyone. Uh, and then some classes need some help. Uh, and Gnome is really big for this as well. But yeah, you can see the timings here, 16 seconds, 56 seconds, 150, and 216 are when these come out. Um, and... Depending on the amount of, is something like a rep pally or a prop pally can freedom themselves and somebody else, which is really nice. Almost everybody else is only able to just do themselves or somebody else. Um, so, for instance, we had a Windwalker that was gnoming the first one, and then Tigers lusting themselves, and they were casting a Tigers lust on somebody else in the first one, and then on the last one they were gnoming and lusting again. And then this third set, we have a bunch of people coming under boss and getting cleaved. The first set, we actually initially had somebody under boss. Uh, we started using Hunter Pet Freedom, even though our Hunter was playing MM uh, on the DH during both of these sets. So this was our plan for dealing with this. Uh, depending on your composition, you may be able to do a different plan. Uh, and depending on the amount of non-Holy Paladins you have, uh, you might be able to completely remove having to kill them during the third root set, which is nice if you can do that, if your comp facilitates that. Uh, and you also want as many gnomes as possible from the people that can't break themselves every time. So uh, monks, rogues, pa uh, priests, all, all these sorts of things. The more gnomes you can have in those, uh, the better. The I mean, the yeah, because the gnome lets the monk cast these tiger's lust on somebody else, which is really valuable. So 
Uh, yeah, that is the theory behind these first roots. So yeah, we clear all of these as soon as they come out. Uh, everybody's going to use a different you know, freedom effect on themselves. You can see all of them are just handled uh, by our strategy there. Uh, and this is really nice because stuff is going to be happening soon. And if you can't clear these, it's really bad. Um, okay, so it does leave behind some gunk when you clear your, your roots. So we kind of try and place that all towards the green as well. And then we get the first set of web blades. Now, web blades, when they spawn, they will target four players kind of one at a time. And if you're using the Liquid Weak Ore pack, which we are, and uh, we, we're we using the Liquid Weak Ore pack in general on this fight, uh, I recommend it. I think it's, it's the best. And you can set up using the notes. It explains everything about how to set up your notes for all this fight uh, so that you can copy the Liquid Strat, which is also the strat that we used for the most part. Uh, our last phase is a little bit different, and I'll explain why when we get there, um, mostly due to reacting to the nerfs, um, which I will... Yeah, again, I'll explain that once we get to P3 in an hour or two. Uh, so web blades, four of them will spawn, which correspond on the liquid bar uh, to these green lines. The, the first one is on just the start of this bar. And then each of these green lines is where one of the web blades appears. And then the red is when they actually trigger. So you don't actually have to move until after this. If you don't move until after the end of this green line, uh, you will not spawn one on you as you're moving, which can sometimes be a problem if you're moving into a nice safe spot and then you spawn one in there. Uh, it cannot be very, it can be very not good. Uh, in some parts of this fight, we play the, these web blades fairly stacked compared to other guilds as well. Uh, and as if you're doing that, it's very nice to kind of wait and then all move as soon as you get the third or the fourth spawn of web blades. Um, there is some pattern to how they spawn. Basically, they'll spawn and then the next one will spawn like rotated slightly counterclockwise and then the next one will spawn again rotated slightly counterclockwise and then the next one will spawn again rotated slightly counterclockwise so actually if we look here i'm going to go back uh, if we look at the very first one to spawn here you can use that if you want um, as soon as these blades come out here comes the first one bang so because they're all going to spawn a little bit rotated uh, counterclockwise you actually can know that if you run out if you're in this spot even if the last one spawns on you as long as you run out this direction just keeping the left edge or the right edge of the, of any of these to your left uh, you can you'll always be safe running out so we use that in a couple spots sometimes you get all four spawning on the same melee clump and then you just all run out uh, in that direction and it's always it's always going to be safe that's always going to be like the least sketchy uh, way that you can run out but it always does look sketchy in general, though, I would say just try not to move too much until uh, ideally at least three of these have spawned. And then we can we kind of all move towards where we want to go, which in this entire phase, we're moving clockwise around this boss room. So yeah, you can see they all spawn and we're out of here. Um, speaking of the roots break, one thing that I do that I think is really good on this is uh, I, as a druid, break myself out by unbear forming and then instantly stampeding roaring because you can actually do that within the same global uh so yeah unshifting and then reshifting into bear will cost you the full global but you can insta go back into bear via stampeding roar or incapacitating roar if you talent that which i don't but uh, that's something that druids can do on this fight so i stampeding roar to that effect on the first and fourth web blades uh, or the first and fourth silken tombs of this fight uh, okay so yeah, the, the web blades come out and we move forward. Now we have our first two world markers here. This is star towards the outside edge of the room and circle towards the inside bit of the room. Uh, these I place every pull uh, and I just place them in the same spots every pull and they uh, correspond to a melee and ranged spot for these uh, toxins to go to. Now, it's not vital that you get them exactly on these spots, but you want to try and get them roughly on these spots. The later ones, precision is more important. These ones, you actually don't have an awful lot of time. So getting there as soon as you can uh, is nice. Uh, and what you basically want to do is you want to split your rate up. Melee will go into the melee one. Range will go into the range one. It's vital that you go 10 and 10. If you go differently than 10 and 10, you're going to get more stacks of the debuff. Uh, so if you have a different split than 10 and 10 of ranged and melee, you'll either want to force some like holy paladins or tanks or whatever to go into the range stack. Uh, and if you have more range than melee, you're going to want to force probably some evokers uh, to go into the melee stack. Evokers are really nice for this fight because if you have like four of them, you can time spiral for all of the um, Silken Tombs of the fight, which is really big for like, Eli our Ellie Shaman needed that to be able to uh, break themselves out of out of the 
the blades or out of the out of the tomb. Uh, a couple other classes as well really like that. Really like getting access to uh, their CD basically for free with the time spirals. So planning those out can be really nice as well. You can just look at. Uh, the public logs now and and map out where those time spirals are. You only really need three evokers for it. We had our fourth actually playing spatial, uh, anyways. But yeah, they're they're they are nice. They're good to have access to. Not required at all. But because we have four of them, if we needed to have an evoker go into melee, like if we had fewer melee than we do, we would have probably uh, evokers would be the first prio to be coming into melee uh, instead of you know, anybody else. Uh, if we needed more to make it ten and ten. Uh, when it comes to who breaks these. As well, we went with an evoker breaking the ranged, uh, a DPS evoker breaking the ranged, and the Havoc Demon Hunter breaking the melee here. It's not too important. I would say just put some reliable players on this, uh, people that don't complain too much about it griefing their CDs or anything right now as well. Uh, and then basically the way that it works on Mythic is that you have to, you have to wait a second between each pop. So our melee, we try and pop sometime around one second left on the cast on this one. And our range then is just waiting for the don't pop to go away, which corresponds to a debuff, a one second debuff that you get. If you pop it during that, you're going to die. But there's actually a pretty generous, you, you stay airborne for about two seconds. So it is pretty generous. Uh, you have a pretty wide range of times that will work for this. Um, so yeah, both teams pop. When you do stand in the circle and get knocked, you will get knocked towards the boss always, um, regardless of where inside the circle you stand. So it just always knocks you towards the boss relative to where you were. Uh, and then whoever does the pop, will have to spread with this circle. Uh, and if they ever get cleaved by another one later down the line, they'll get one shot. That's that You can't do it twice, and you also can't get cleaved after you've done it once. You should try not to cleave the raid in general. It's extra damage you want to avoid. Uh, but yeah, you can see our two people with the circles going out, everybody else staying in. Now, once you've done these soaks, you see we have two stacks of a debuff on everybody. That doesn't actually do anything until it expires. And then when it expires, it hits for a bunch of damage and leaves behind a dot for the amount of stacks that it had. Uh, so that is quite nasty on the raid. If anything else hits you during that time, it's kind of scary and you'll get more and more of them later. Um, so the pools turn into, we had to dodge the waves that they shot out, which are also very one-shotty. Uh, and then you have to now have the next liquefy and feast combo. So I pull the boss, I taunt the boss and pull it kind of into this area uh, to try and save space. And then it immediately does these pools. Again, you can see I dropped pretty low here. Uh, if you just have bark skin, for instance, you need to be topped. Uh, at least I did with my stats. Uh, you, if I'm not topped, I'm going to die here even with bark skin. Uh, or you can just use more CDs. I would do that on some pools as well, but I was trying to min max damage at this point. Um, okay, so feast comes out. And now we we have the world markers have moved. So I would always pre-pull put diamond right here. And then at some point, I'm not sure if you even caught when I did it this pull, uh, as soon as we don't need it on these first sets anymore, I move them to be about here and here. I'm probably going to adjust them on this pull because this is a little off. Star needs to be a little bit forward and circle maybe a tiny bit forward so that it's a nice line uh, with diamond. There are a bunch of different spots you can put these markers, but I would just, for consistency, I would always line up diamond with this little gem and that worked for us. Uh, but if for some reason somebody in your raid complains about it and has some reason for it to go somewhere else, it's probably fine. Whatever good reason somebody has is probably fine. Uh, so after this liquefy, the next thing we're going to get is the second set of roots. Uh, this one is important to be able to, to break quickly because you got to be moving for blades soon again. All the roots are basically like that. Uh, but the third set is the best one to not break if you have to choose because that one uh, is a nice one for CD timings, especially warrior CD timings to be available for. Uh, so yeah, here come these roots. And again, everybody's planning something different to break themselves out. Uh, we have even, we have bubble freedom here to get the last free freedom that we need uh, for this set. And now we get blades. And so again, notice that I'm standing still in the epicenter of all these blades, waiting to move until the third or fourth uh, spawns. And I saw where the first one was spawning and I'm just running out along its edge. And then we're completely safe there. Uh, and then we move forward. So now we're going to get blades again. So what we do is we take those first blades from where the liquify was, we move forwards to about this line on the ground, we get the second set of blades here, and now we move backwards, and we're going to take the boss back towards these world markers uh, so that we can place all three of them there. Uh, and what we did with these is the liquid we core would have you say, like your star, your circle, uh, to drop them. We treated that as more of a soft assignment than a hard assignment. So if somebody was closer or could call it, they would open up voice comms and they would be like, I'm going melee or something like that. Uh, and that was a really good way to do it because sometimes it just didn't make sense based on the person who got assigned circle happened to be over here. The person who got assigned star happened to be over here. Uh, it is pretty smart about it though. The liquid one will assign the 
meleeist people to star and the rangest people to purple. Uh, but you'll notice, yeah, now there's three soaks that need to happen. Uh, so for this set, we did our most melee people in star, our most ranged people in diamond, and then circle obviously has to have a little bit of a mix. Uh, so this one, we put some melee and then evokers was kind of the, the idea there. Uh, so we had our four evokers, one tank, which was me, and one DPS warrior in the middle one. All the other melee were in star, all the other ranged were in purple. Again, you can adjust this a little bit. The people doing the breaks were our Windwalker in melee, uh, a Prez Evoker in the middle, and a Ellie Shaman uh, in the back with uh, Spirit Walker's Grace. Um, so here comes the cast on this one. And the idea here is that Star should break with about 1.5 in the cast here. They did it on one, which is totally fine as well. Uh, Circle is going to break right about when the cast finishes. And Diamond is going to break anytime after the debuff goes away, anytime after the don't pop goes away. Uh, and it's important here if you're on circle and you're breaking with our timing that you're not in the front of the circle because the Venom Nova might hit you before you get knocked up in the air. We had that happen a couple times. So I would just always take a step back right before that uh, break happened uh, so that I wouldn't ever accidentally get clipped by the Venom Nova before I got knocked airborne. Uh, okay, so now once again, everybody is run the people that were doing the breaks are running out, spreading. Everybody else is kind of under boss. Uh, and we've got Toxic Waves to dodge. So part of the thing that's nice here is the more often you can consistently put them on these exact markers, these Toxic Waves will be predictable and everybody will know where they usually go uh, and they can dodge them that way. Uh, and now we have a Web Blades during these, these Toxic Waves as well. This is a very dangerous spot because you're taking heavy unavoidable damage once this stack, once the three stack explodes, and you're going to then get one shot if you get hit by a Web Blades or a Toxic Waves. So this is a great spot to fire a defensive um, and just focus on dodging, lose up time if you need to, uh, at least for your the start of progression. Uh, so again, we have web blades here. You can see melee is absolute absolute war zone. Uh, I use a bunch of CDs on this set because I'm about to get liquefied here, and I basically don't want to get one shot. So I, I overload defensives on this one so that I can get hit by a web blade or a toxic wave if I suck, which I don't on this clip, but uh, I have on some of our polls. Um, so here come the here comes that liquefy, and I've moved into a safe spot here. We just generally try and keep the boss kind of in the corner area here, uh, and I usually try and keep it spun around so that the melee don't get parried as much as possible. And uh, this one also, we're a lot more flexible on our swirly spawning. You can see there's an evoker spawning a swirly up in front of the boss. That's kind of banned on the other sets. But on this one, we use more space to be more safe. So spread more, spread forward more, do whatever you need to do to not die on this set. And we basically spend more space on this set because it is so sketchy. Okay, after this, the next thing that's going to be is, uh, is Roots. So this one is, we called these those Roots We Hate uh, because we needed to kill them. So we would kill them with like Ellie Shaman Stormbringer on Chain Lightning and Fury Warrior CDs. I think after the nerf, we took away the, the Chain Lightnings even, uh, and we were just blasting the boss even more. Uh, but yeah, we, for the at least the start of Prague, I'd recommend just blow these roots up if you're getting them, uh, depending on the amount that you're getting. And the people that need to get broken out come under the boss, and everybody else kind of stays out in an AMZ uh, or stays out in general. Uh, and we have a bunch of roots here that need to get broken, uh, so we try and kill them off before these web blades. Not a lot of time there. Those things have quite a bit of health as well, even post-nerf. So uh, you do need to swap, hard swap to them, at least for the start of Prague until you're getting used to this fight. Overcommit to that and then start taking stuff off as you're getting better at it. Again, you'll notice that I have moved the markers again because now we are going to get a four set of soaks that need to be handled uh, on this fight. So uh, first we get another set of roots out here. This is going to be the fourth roots. Uh, and before this one, four people are going to get toxins. Now... Of our 20 players in the raid, two are tanks and can't get targeted by toxins, and five have already been targeted by toxins. So if you're one of the five that's already been targeted by toxins, you actually can't be targeted this time around. So there's actually only 13 people that are legal targets and seven people that aren't. The seven people that aren't, we try and have play more towards the left side, uh, and the, the 13 people that are, especially the range that are, we have play more towards where the markers are and spread in that way. Once you do get one of those circles around you, you start pulsing AoE damage, so it's always good to be spread, especially on this four set, because if two or three people are stacked, it's so much damage as it comes out. Um, so our potential targets are spread out here, and you can see, look, look at this, we have a bunch of people already out that are being targeted by this, and a bunch of people who that weak aura either tells you to bait toxin or don't bait, and it's either red or green. If it's green, you know you can be stacked and over on the left, and you're not in danger uh, of actually being a valid target for that, uh, for that soak. So, uh, four people get targeted, again, 
we need to now go onto all the markers. So I moved star, circle, and diamond, and I keep triangle. I put triangle up before the pull, just basically in the very middle of the room. Uh, and then we have to move the boss. So let's talk about what's going to happen here. So these roots are absolutely vital that you break instantly. These ones really, really need to, to get broken right away. And we're going to have web blades afterwards. Now, what we don't want to have happen is the, the, the like last few web blades are actually going to fire as we need to be popping star and to a lesser extent circle. So we need to get far. We, we start on this side. We break our roots and we sprint over to the other side. I guess my camera's reflected, but we sprint over to that side, right? We sprint over that way. And then as the web blades are getting baited, we now start cheating back towards star and circle. It's not that important for range to do this, but the melee that are involved in soaking star and circle really need to do this. So this is where I use my Stampeding Roar, uh, which also has the effect of breaking me out in a, a free GCD, which is nice. Uh, and we run over to the right. And now we're kind of all over on the right of these, these lines. We bait our web blades over here, and now we start running back to the left into these. Um, and the idea here is the, this is very tight timing because there's all four of them, uh, and they need to get broken with more than a second between each one. So star breaks around that 1.5 mark is when we're hoping to see it. This time it was on one, which is fine. Uh, now circle breaks basically as soon as we're allowed to, as soon as don't pop goes away. And then diamond and triangle also basically follow that rule of just as soon as don't pop goes away, you can run in. Uh, for this set, we had one tank, windwalker, two frost decays, and a rogue in star. And we actually had our blood decay breaking star. We had me, the bear, uh, our holy paladin, our havoc DH, and our two warriors in circle. And one of our warriors broke that. We had our four evokers and our Ellie shaman in diamond, which is the third one back. Uh, and we had a the other Prez Evoker that hadn't already broken, broke that one. And then we had all, all of the rest of our ranged out in Triangle, and one of our mages uh, broke that. And basic idea here is that the Star Breaker, would, this was our tank, he would kind of run this way. I would taunt the boss to keep it still. Our warrior that broke would cheat into the corner here. The rest of our raid would kind of play safe here. And our range would spread. I don't even know, they spread somewhere. Yeah, okay, our, our Evoker jumped. They, they both spread kind of further down and with our current perspective away from the rest of the raid who can play by these. And now there's a lot of waves to dodge and the boss is going to jump towards the middle and we're going to have intermission time here. Note that if anybody is low here, they're about to die once this debuff expires, right? Look at everybody's health here. Very important that you defensive or are topped. Uh, standard AMZ is really good here as well. We use two AMZs, one for the melee and one for the ranged. Uh, and watch this bang, big hit and then a nasty dot as well. And now we are into the intermission. Uh, so the first thing that happens in the intermission is the boss shields itself. So as, all the damage you can do before the boss shields itself is really nice. Once you're ready to kill this boss, you're going to have more damage than you need to break the shield. Um, although they actually nerfed the boss HP more than, and they didn't nerf the shield when they first nerfed this encounter. So uh, especially for progression, overcommit to the shield and then start taking stuff off of it as you start getting better at this phase. Uh, but yeah, now we what we want to do is we're all going to be getting gripped in. During this entire phase, this entire intermission, if you stand on top of somebody, you're both going to be ticking each other. But it doesn't tick for that much. So don't be scared of stacking on top of one other person, uh, stacking on top of even a couple of other people. It's okay. Uh, it's better to do that than to spread really aggressively and, and be scared of standing on top of somebody. But if you are low, you know, be careful uh, about it. So first grip is going to come out here, and basically we all want to kind of be in this line uh, so that we spawn, because when you get gripped on Mythic, you leave behind a web under you. Uh, so we all kind of get back here, and we're trying to spawn some nice webs. People are using, like, Death's Advance, and if you're using something like Death's Advance, run into the old webs, run into the old area, uh, so that you aren't going to spawn webs ahead of us. Because if you spawned a web, even just kind of in melee here, they grow quite a lot, and it would actually end up uh, co uh, polluting a lot of melee uh, after that. Uh, so now after this one, the boss is going to start shooting out waves, and also it's going to be stacking a, a poison on us as well uh, that's going to be slowing us down and doing more damage. That poison also means that the next rest, the next grip in, actually does more damage as well. Like, it amps the damage of the, the grip in, so the, the second grip actually is kind of scary. Uh, they nerfed it a lot, so it's not a one-shot anymore, but it was a one-shot when we were first doing this phase, which was, uh, was kind of crazy. Um, so... We spread out during this phase. You can see the waves kind of, we kind of form some sort of columns, but you'll notice we're kind of stacking on each other and it's fine, right? People's healths aren't looking too scary, even though there's some stacking happening here. After three of these waves spawn, we are now getting gripped in again. Uh, and so for this one, 
we just all kind of, again, we, we want to dodge these waves, but be as far to the old we webs as possible here. So people over here are definitely being really helpful. On this set, being over here was fine. I'm not just saying that because I was over here, but uh, this wave was really obnoxious. Uh, but it's okay. You get enough space to do that. Uh, and we're, yeah, we get gripped in again. That one does quite a bit of damage. This weak aura at the top basically shows you this red line is when the third grip will come out, and that's going to kill you. It, technically, you could live it, but it's going to kill you, and you're going to run out of space. So don't try and live the, the red line. Once you get gripped the second time, you're not getting that third grip. You're either beating the boss or it's beating you. Uh, so you need to make sure you break the intermission before the red line finishes. Ideally, not too far ahead, though, either. You don't want to be too far ahead, either. That means you're overcommitting, and your CDs will probably be griefed a little bit. So uh, you want to milk this intermission phase for about, maybe you have a second to spare to be safe, uh, something like that. And you want to prep a bunch of globals to hit the boss coming out of the intermission, uh, because it does take damage for, like, three globals out of the intermission, uh, depending on your haste. So you might be able to get some good damage in there with something like a Mad Queen's Mandate, uh, or or, which I guess isn't up then, but with your, you know, a couple of good globals, some good overloaded Stormkeeper lightning bolts or whatever. Um, okay, so yeah, the last one's coming out here. We, we got to dodge these waves. Note that the waves don't go away uh, at the end of this phase. So even if one is just spawning under the boss, uh, you do have to watch out for these still. Uh, and then here, the boss is now going to be gripping us in, but we all know that this is going to be fake, right? We're going to beat the boss before this cast finishes. We're now in this final little safe area, which is why we do this fight from the beginning, right, these are the puddles we dropped at the very start of the fight, basically, uh, behind us to our left now, uh, and we're running out of space, but we break the boss, and we end up actually getting 0.7% of the boss's health taken care of in those three globals, which is nice. Uh, every point of damage matters on the boss. Now, phase two begins. Uh, so as soon as phase two begins, as soon as the boss actually starts getting gripped up here, the webs disappear, the, the poison disappears in the ground, the waves don't. Um, but... During those three free globals that you're milking the boss, the webs don't go away. So make sure you don't stand in them because they actually do a lot of damage if you're standing in the webs. Now you need to break up your raid into two different groups that go to the two different sides. Uh, and on each of the sides, there's always a portal that you can take to go to the other side. If you don't take that portal within 12 seconds of it starting its cast, uh, it will wipe you. So you need to have assignments of people to swap on each side. Uh, and we did this with like healers up first. And then we swapped DKs from one side and mages from the other side. So two DKs on the next two and two mages on the other side. Uh, and then we did like, I don't know, Ellie Shim. We had kind of, we kind of set it up so that we had a, almost all of our melee would be on one side uh, during the second platform. And almost all of our range would be on the other uh, and I'll explain why we did that when we get there, but you're basically, you just have to like kind of look at a log and uh, see who's going where and figure out for your own guild what's going to make the most sense. Um, but yeah, so we start off here uh, and you can see who's heading to which side here. So at the very start, we are sending Druid Tank, two Frosty Ks, Havoc Demon Hunter, two Dev Evokers, uh, one Ellie Shaman, and then we're sending one Prez Evoker and one Holy Paladin to this side, which is, this is going to be the side with the two Acolytes uh, that spawns on it, whereas the other side gets an extra tank add. That's a difference that the two sides get on their second platform. Otherwise, it's entirely the same. Now, to start off this phase, you have this Void Speaker. While you're in combat here, down on the ground floor, Ansrek is going to be shooting people with Acid Bolts that leave a 30-second dot. Make sure your healers have that on their frames and know who's got it, uh, because it is a very scary dot to have during the first platform. So whoever has that needs to be careful, needs to watch out. Uh, but mostly during this phase, you're just dodging the orbs uh, and you are taking the portal as needed. So we, we swap immediately on this first portal. We swap our Holy Paladin and our Holy Priest uh, on, the, on the first swap. And they just need to go before the Shadowgate finishes its cast here, uh, which the Liquid Weak Aura also tells you. We changed it to be 12 seconds instead of 10, which is what it was pre-nerf. I don't know if the actual Weak Aura is updated for that. Uh, just yet as well if you download it. But it's an easy fix to make if you need to for your weak aura. Uh, so yeah, they have to go through before this cast finishes. You want to go late so that you can avoid... Um, if you go too early, it'll start the new cast early, and then you might have to send a second person. Our goal here is to not have to send the second person uh, because as soon as you actually kill this thing, this Void Speaker, it, the portals will move up to the second platform or to the first platform, and they'll, start, they'll reset their cast, basically. Uh, so you can gain a bunch of time that way and do fewer swaps. Each time you do a swap, whoever goes through the portal will get a dot, 
that will, when it gets dispelled, it'll leave behind a puddle underneath them that does a bunch of damage, and it will hit everybody for like three mil uh, on that side. So we we do those dispels, but you don't want to you want to do as few as possible. So we do one swap here on this ground floor, uh, but mostly we're just kicking the ad and dodging the orbs. The orbs will one shot you if you're not a tank. Um, you do want to set up a kick rotation for these ads. We had people marking these ads, and we had a kick rotation using the old interrupt tracker weak aura thing that's been kicking around for ages uh, on these particular ads. So I would recommend that. we. It's a very frustrating thing to wipe to is just missing a kick. Uh, and you don't have a lot of people on either side. You don't want to overdo kicks. Uh, so I would set up actual kick rotations on marked ads on these. Okay, uh, so here you can see this in action. Our two people are getting ready to swap. They go through their portal and they come, come to the other side and then they do their dispels out to the side. Uh, you can just do this dispel under the portal. You shouldn't need to take the portal again. We did it off to the side because during progression, we would sometimes do our second swap down here and we just wanted that to work, but it's actually okay to just do the dispel right where the portal is uh, on this set, especially now that it's a 12 second thing. Um, so if people are wondering why you don't do that, why we don't do that, it's just because we didn't during progression and I guess we never changed it back, but you certainly could once you're ready to kill the boss. Um, again, make sure you're dodging these orbs, but as soon as you kill this Void Speaker, which shares health with the Void Speaker on the other side, by the way, uh, so both sides will be on the same pace for most of this phase. Uh, as soon as you kill this, the orbs disappear. Any swirlies will still kill you if you stand in them, though, so don't stand in the swirlies, but the orbs will go away. Uh, and then we get in position to get knocked here, and we go up to our first platforms. Our first swap is a Frosty K for a, a, an Arcane Mage, and our second swap... Uh, so, sorry, our second and third total swaps, and the, the two that we're going to do on this platform, are DKs from our side for mages from their side. Uh, and we start off here, we have a Guardian and an Exhumer, Expeller, on both sides. Uh, and the goal here is to cleave them both down. Again, these share health with their counterparts on the other platform, so it's not like you need to worry about balancing damage between the two sides currently. Uh, all damage is the same across the two. But what you do need to balance is damage between the Guardian and the Expeller, because you need to kill both of them before you can finish this phase. Uh, so what we do is we bring the Guardian over to the Expeller and stack it up over here uh, so that we can try and cleave them both down nicely, and they're doing the same thing over on the other side. Now... During this phase, you're going to be getting gripped by the boss, and you're going to be cleaving people under you when you're getting gripped as well, and just like in the intermission, but only when the boss is actually channeling on your side. The boss will alternate which side it grips on, and on this platform, it will always grip like the same sides in the same order. Um, so we are getting gripped here, and we kind of all try and play towards not the side that we're going to be going, and we leave behind the webs under us over on this side. I am a bear, so I need to get rescued here. Everybody else is using like Death's Advance, Glide, Glide, Glide. And then the two people that don't have anything are playing near the back of the room, right? That's their kind of idea uh, so that they can get gripped safely without getting killed. Uh, but you can see even like Dark Pact was used there by our Warlock. Uh, so I get rescued back onto safety and uh, keep dragging this to be on top of the Expeller. You can tell when the beams are going to come out. The, the Liquid Weaker pack will have a bait beam timer. And it's nice to bait the beams just off to the side. There are some spots where you don't want to aim it directly at the portal. Although ever since they nerfed it to 12 seconds, we found that we weren't actually having overlaps where it mattered uh, to aim it straight at the portal. So, uh, But do try and aim it not at your raid if you can. So I always try and play off to the side such that if it targets me, you can see there this time, it targeted somebody way off to the side. Beautiful beam. Nobody's going to get hit by this, right? Um, once you kill off these two, here comes the third grip of the phase, the second on our side, right? It goes our side, their side, our side. Our goal and strategy is to beat this third grip. So we play like it's not going to go off. During progression, it's going to go off for you for a while. So play so that that doesn't kill you. But I'm playing so that if this goes off, it's going to kill me so that I can just keep cleaving as much as possible onto these two. Uh, and then once we kill these, you see we have 1.9 seconds. As long as you click both of these pylons in time, uh, you won't get gripped off. So we have somebody actually assigned to clicking each of them to be ready and they click. And now as soon as this bridge spawns, the grip gets canceled. The next grip will choose the side of whichever side gets somebody up onto the platform first. So we make sure that that is always the other team because our side, I don't know, that was better. That, we, we like that more. Um, so we had a warrior on the other side, heroic leap to touch the edge of their side, uh, of their platform first to make sure that the fourth bait uh, was always, or the fourth grip was always on them first, and then we would get the fifth and they'd get the sixth, uh, which was always really nice. Um, movement CDs are really good here as well. Time Spiral, Windrush, Stampeding Roar, all that kind of stuff. 
ration those out so that you have something for each bridge if you can, if you can manage it. Um, so now up we go. These skitterers need to be picked up by your tank. Try not to get a bunch of threat on them if you're somebody else. If you're a tank, you kind of just learn how you can try and hit all of them uh, with some AoE abilities. I'm using Incarn here, so I, I can get quite a bit of threat that way uh, and just try and get as much threat as I can. Now on our side, we have an Expeller, which shares health with their Expeller. We have a Worshipper, which actually doesn't share shield with their Worshipper. So these two Worshippers are a separate DPS check. And then we have two Acolytes, and they have another Guardian. Um, another, yeah, another, another tank ad on the other side instead. So the two platforms are quite different here. These are Acolytes can't really be hit by melee. So we have engineered it so that our side is mostly ranged here, including Dev Evokers, who do a great job of nuking these Acolytes. Uh, same with the Arcane Mages. So... We have our like our havoc DH is throw glaving here, and then and our you know we have a basically no other melee on our side of the room right now. Uh, we currently are going to be sending them our Ellie Shaman and getting their rogue uh, on the next portal swap. Uh, you do have to be careful of the dispels here, and I think on this platform one person will randomly get the gloom touch as well, not just your portal swappers, uh, which is the dispel that needs to happen. So don't quote me on that. That's healer stuff. Uh, this video. Well, I'll try and cover a little healer stuff, but I don't really understand it all that well. Uh, okay, so we're grabbing all the skitterers and taking them under the worshiper and the expeller. The rain or the melee we do have here is this DH who is blowing up the skitterers and doing a bunch of damage to the expeller and the worshiper. And our ranged are basically focusing on taking out those acolytes. Uh, we have our Ellie Shaman going Darth Sidious or whatever on these. Uh, on all the Expellers and Skitterers as well here. The Skitterers do stack up a nasty damage taken increase on their primary target, so make sure that's your tank and try not to have your tank die uh, using defensives here as a tank. This is a good time for doing it. Um, so yeah, we kill off these. Again, now here comes the fifth grip of the phase, which is the first one for us on this platform. And this one actually lines up with a beam from the Expeller. So what you want to make sure that happens is that you don't get gripped into the beam unless you're a tank, in which case you actually can live it. Um, but everybody else, don't get gripped into the beam. So you can see we're all kind of running away from that beam so we don't get gripped straight into it because uh, it does go off as we're midair here. Uh, and it does also hit a little bit behind the Expeller too. So be very careful of that. Um, so yeah, we finished those off. Now we are swapping uh, our DH for one of their warriors uh, on this next portal swap. Uh, so the people are going nice and early over there. We're finishing off the last acolytes, and we're getting ready to clip or to click. Uh, we are keeping a rogue. The rogue that just swapped to our side is just staying by this, ready to click. And then I'm going to try and click this one, and we click. The next web bridge is spawned, and uh, stampeding roar. I'm going to use here so we can get up as fast as we can, and grab all the skitterers again. Now on this platform, you don't get gripped by the boss anymore. But you do have the orbs to dodge, like in the bottom part of this fight. And you have, a again, one of the adds to kick, uh, from like, just like the bot. So this is just like the very start of the phase, uh, except you also have skitterers here. So you do need to watch out for that. And you have a portal that people are, are swapping through and that you need to swap through twice on this phase. Uh, so here we are sending them one of our evokers. We're getting their Windwalker uh, on this swap here. And I'm trying not to die. This is a good spot to use some defensives because... This is sketchy as you start getting, you see I start getting a bunch of stacks from these skitterers. Now, we actually don't need that much damage on this Void Speaker. You have a very long time before the Acid Apocalypse, Acidic Apocalypse cast finishes. Um, so we actually had our Arcade Mages just killing the, the spiders, right? They were casting Touch of the Magi on a skitterer uh, rather than on this thing. Uh, and we actually would slow our damage so that we could have as long as possible in this phase so that we could have our CDs back for the last phase. So you may consider doing that as well. Um, but we didn't. what we didn't want to have happen is we didn't want these seventh swappers to actually have to get dispelled. We wanted to finish the phase so that their debuff would just go away, which is what happens at the end of this phase if there are any portal swap debuffs outstanding. Uh, but the main thing in this platform is just land your kicks. Still use a kick assignment weak aura, land your kicks, uh, just like you needed to do on the Acolytes on the last platform, by the way. And then uh, dodge the orbs. The orbs will one-shot you, don't get hit by those. That's the main thing on this platform. Uh, and then we would have our seventh people swap, which was our other dev evoker for their MM Hunter. And we would do these swaps. And then these people would, we would be getting ready to kill this and we would kill. You can see we have about nine seconds left on the Acid Apocalypse. That's about when we would usually aim to kill it. Again, this swirly is live. Don't get hit by this swirly. Uh, that one is still, is still off and is going to kill you. And uh, we have this, once this knockback goes off, any outstanding portal dispel debuffs will just go away, which means you don't have to take the raid damage or leave the gunk behind uh, for people to stand in and take damage from. 
Uh, so we would just have, you know, them spread a little bit away from the rest of us, and then it would just go away on its own going into this phase without having to get dispelled. All right, phase three begins. Now in phase three, uh, coming from my side here, we have the square marker, the skull marker, and the moon marker are static. So you can just set these up on one pull and they never have to move again. But there are a bunch of other markers. There are four other markers that you do have to set up every time you, actually five other markers you do have to set up every time you get here. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do star here, circle here, and uh, diamond here, which you can helpfully remember because that's the same order that the soaks go in P1. I was just doing all of our markers on this fight. You could also just assign one person to each marker uh, to replace every time and they, they just have to know where it goes. I just decided to take all that responsibility on so that other people could just do their damage and stuff. Um, but you can split that up as you see fit among your guild. Uh, but yeah, we want to mark all six of the edges here, all six of the points of this hexagon. Uh, and then we have a red marker and a green marker, which are going to indicate the portal drop locations. The red marker is going to be the melee portal drop, and the green marker is going to be the ranged portal drop. Now, depending on how you want to do the end of this fight, you can actually do these slightly differently. Uh, because at the very end of the fight, there's going to be a set of five acolytes that will spawn on every point of this hexagon, except for blue square. Blue square ideally is the one that, that is empty. Uh, and so one of them will be over here, just to my left, where I'm about to place a star marker. And some guilds are just ignoring that acolyte, and they're just trying to kill the boss before the Frothing Gluttony cast finishes. Other guilds, like what we did, is we actually killed that acolyte to get like 10 more seconds on our Enrage. Uh, and because of that, that affects where we can place this portal versus where you might want to place this if your plan is to just ignore that acolyte uh, and kill the boss instead. So I will explain that as it comes up. But... Uh, right, what happens right now is you get 20 seconds, just blast the boss. Everybody comes over to this side, to the, the side that had the ranged players uh, predominantly. And you can see those. I placed the markers for the scope, or the spokes of the, the hexagon. And I also placed our first X and our first triangle. If you are going to skip killing this last ad on star on the five set, you can instead have red X in melee. But if you, like us, want to kill this acolyte, you need to pr place red X far enough back that when the portal turns into gunk on the ground, it doesn't put gunk on this inner channel so that your melee can actually walk along it to this last acolyte. That's the reason it goes back here um, if you're doing that strat. But if you're not doing that strat, you don't have to do this. As you get more and more damage, you probably won't have to do this uh, at all. You'll probably be killing the boss while those five acolytes are alive. Uh, and so you can move the red X up inwards and get an, a longer, more generous first portal cast. Okay, um, so P3 comes out. We have the Ephotic Communion, I think. I don't know. Boss does its cast. Actually, I don't know what the full word is here. I'm going to guess it's Communion. Uh, you're just blasting the boss here, and then it lands right in front of Moon. Now, what we're going to do is we have our ranged just in line with the boss, and we're going to drag the boss over here. What's important on the boss positioning here, we, we always bring it just nice over by this area, and during this area, people are going to be baiting swirlies under them. We want to put all of those kind of back up against the edge of this donut here as much as we can, uh, and not in the middle area, not forward, not in the inner ring. So this area is where we want to be baiting. Uh, so all of our range are stacked, and once those swirlies start getting baited under them, they're going to move forward. Similarly, our, our, our melee are going to stack, and then they're also going to kind of move through and up to try and avoid dodging towards star, for instance, and polluting this area that we kind of want to use later. Um, so you can see this in action here. Up first is going to be infest, which is a big hit on the, the tank, uh, and then leaves behind a circle on them. As soon as the infest cast starts, you can taunt as the other tank, uh, and then the other tank is going to get gorge slammed on them, which is a big physical combo that leaves behind a physical vulnerability. So once again, the other tank is taking all the infests, I'm taking all the gorges, and then he's tanking the boss for the, room, for the rest of the phase um, while I have this physical vulnerability on me. So the, uh, the circle goes there, I taunt the boss, and I move the boss forward-ish a little bit, and you can keep the boss fairly close to these adds, but... So that'll give you more cleave onto the boss, but it will also make it so that you'll wipe instantly if you miss a stun instead of having a second for somebody to notice and stun. Um, you need to keep these adds from reaching the boss. It's basically a wipe if even one does. Ring of Peace is really good for this. We would always use Ring of Peace on these, but Ring of Peace is sometimes fiddly. 
Um, so we also just started stunning right away. We impressive roared and stunned basically right away on all of these ad sets as well. Um, and yeah, the goal was just play it safe. Don't mess around with it because it's a really annoying thing to wipe to. And we have the damage regardless. Um, that was our thought process on this mechanic. So uh, boss comes this way. We spawn up here. And again, you can see I pull it a little bit away here. You could have the boss pretty much in the middle of this ring of peace if you wanted to. Uh, and you can see the swirlies have been baited, or the, the yeah, the, the gunk has been baited by our melee kind of over here, and our ranged all baited it there, and we're moving forward rather than moving inwards. And nice, clean puddles that we are all kind of stacked really good. Uh, so we use Ring of Peace, Ursula's Vortex. As soon as the other tank taunts, I'm going to charge in here and start just blasting these uh, adds as much as I can as well. And our goal is just get these things killed. They'll also leave behind gunk when they die. Uh, and you can see they're all just killed over there. Beautiful. Now here come the first big ads. This is a set of three big ads. And what's important for spawning these three ads in these spots is it, the boss will always pick the N closest points of this inner hexagon to herself to spawn these ads. Um, so we would place her such that that would be star, moon, and a square up here. So in order to do this, all you need to do is you need to make sure that Anserek is closer to star than to moon or square. As long as that's true, it'll be in these three spots. If you were closer to square, for instance, it would not spawn on moon. It would spawn on the one past square instead, which is circle up there. Um, so yeah, that's all we do for this. There's a, a wide range of positions that work for this, just as long as you are closer to star than either of these other markers. That's all you need to do on this set. Uh, and these three ads come out. And our goal here, now we have web blades to dodge and we kind of move towards the ads and start killing them. Now these ads will start casting. They can be kicked once you do 40% of their health, which breaks the shield, right? They, they have 60% of their health and then a 40% health shield uh, on top of that. Uh, so it all, it all adds up to 100%, but it starts, it's weird. Uh, so you, you want to kill them and break that shield and then get the kicks going. Once you break the shield, it's lower prio. You don't need to break it. It's not urgent. Especially on the three set, you're not going to die to the cast. Even if they get a couple of stacks, every time they successfully cast, their damage goes up. It doubles, basically. Not like a... Like it gains plus 100% of the base damage uh, of the cast. So the first cast does like 700k. The second cast does uh, 1.4 mil. The third cast does 2.1 mil, etc. Uh, that they successfully get off. But even if like two of them get off a cast with a, with a one stack, that's 2.8 mil that you're getting hit with. There's not a lot of other damage happening here. That usually won't kill people. So don't over-index on killing these. Um, do break the shields. Do switch to them. Uh, do have your efficient people switching to them. But you also need to be doing boss damage here. And then what you do want to do is make sure that once the shields are broken on them, that you're kicking them. We didn't do a kick tracker weak aura on these or anything like that. We just kind of YOLO'd the kicks. But um, I was calling kicks a lot. Like I was calling, make sure we kick this, make sure we kick this, that, those kind of stuff. So that people wouldn't just, you know, otherwise you might tunnel and you might miss them. And that does happen. And then you might wipe if you got a bunch of like three stack casts off. Uh, Curse of Tongues does weak, work on these, by the way, even when they're not kickable. Uh, so Curse of tongue, Tonguesing, the far ones can often be a good strat. But yeah, we basically, we're always moving again clockwise during this phase, uh, basically. So the most counterclockwise one is usually killed by our range, by our Destro Lock, by our Ellie Shaman. They're really good at killing that one. And then we kind of use the boss, we move the boss on top of the other ones and melee cleave them down. Uh, that's our idea here. So first we dodge these nasty web blades, uh, and then we are breaking and trying to kick these, these detonations. We kick the first cast on the middle one, and all few, the first cast went off on the others. Uh, the other thing that will happen is when these acolytes die, they'll drop an essence that needs to be picked up and brought through all of the novas for the rest of the fight. Now, this mechanic has been changed from world first progression. So this is part of where our strategy now deviates from the liquid strat. Uh, we don't have a tank pick one up every time. We, you have to do three essences through the first Nova, seven essences through the second Nova. And then we said, it dies or we die. We are not going to beat that third Nova. So we just left all 12 essences on the ground and we killed the boss before that last Nova, uh, which I think you will have enough damage to do that with the health nerf on this pretty much for sure if you're able to reach that point of the fight. Um, so I think that is a good strat. Uh, so we did basically three ranged players who don't have to take the portal to move their essence on this first one. So like our, a warlock, a mage, some other thing like that. Uh, let me, I wrote this down somewhere. Uh, it's gone. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see. It's it's like Warlock Mage. 
maybe Warrior. Yeah, Warlock, Mage, Warrior, I think, who can leap the Nova. And that way they don't take the portal, which means the portal doesn't even destabilize, which is what happens. It doesn't destabilize immediately, which is what happens if an Essence person goes through the portal. So that was our strat for this. But what's important is that as soon as one of these Acolytes dies, they will spawn an Essence on their World Marker. Don't pick those up if you're not supposed to. And if you are an Essence picker-upper, do try and pick it up roughly on the timer that the Liquid Weak Auras give you. It's a good time to pick it up. You'll be dropping at a good time. If you pick it up early or late, it'll be awkward. There'll be awkward mechanics going on as you drop uh, that, you know, you'll have web blades that'll be trying to force you to stand still, but you'll be dropping an essence that you want to move off of. So uh, yeah, pick up on that timer. It's, it's valuable. Uh, okay, so yeah, we kill these ads. Portals come out. Again, one person goes to, to X, one person goes to Triangle. We had this such that melee got preferred to go to X and range got preferred to go to triangle. Uh, the liquid weak aura will automatically make it so that if two melee get picked, the more mobile one will get sent to triangle. And if two range get picked, the more mobile one will get sent to X. But the way we were playing, it was actually kind of harder to, to move like that anyways. So you may want to consider adjusting this. Just make sure that you're playing near the one that you're more likely to get assigned to if you are immobile. Um... You can also just treat it as a soft assign rather than a hard assign and just call out which person is going where. That also works. But again, you'll note that because we placed red where we did, this circle doesn't make it to the inner ring, which is important for our strat. Uh, and then triangle is going nice and far out so that it's actually far enough out that the Nova will have passed over it before it passes over X. Uh, okay, so it's coming time to pick up essences and Frothing Gluttony is now getting cast. The Acolytes needs to be dead before this cast finishes. Once this cast finishes, if there are any Acolytes left alive, it will just explode their essence immediately. So you need the Acolytes to have died by then, uh, but you can cut it kind of close if you're optimizing boss damage. That's totally fine. Uh, now the boss goes into the middle of the room, and we are taking the portal here, basically right before the Nova reaches it. Everybody takes this portal. It's not that tight because note that the portal doesn't instantly destabilize because nobody with an essence is going through it, right? Our warlock is circling, our warrior's leaping, and our mage is blinking uh, over this this uh, Nova. So it actually, you have a nice long time to move out of this portal, which is a benefit of setting it up that way. If for some reason your comp requires you to have people or you want your tanks to still do it or something uh, to go through this portal that have the essence, it will start destabilizing much more quickly and you'll have to do this much more carefully and much more quickly uh, like we do on the second set but yeah as soon as we come out of this uh, we got a spread now big spreads come out uh, and you just kind of want to spread to consistent places our essence people are about to drop their essences and they are going to drop their essences behind square uh, so counterclockwise a square is where we drop these essences and so what we don't want to have happen is we don't want people to spread into square. Uh, so if you're spreading, we're kind of trying to keep square clear and everywhere else is fair game. And our essence people are, and our other people that like leapt the Nova or whatever are stacking there. That's a safe spot that's guaranteed for them. And then they can drop their essences there. The boss comes back up. You can see all of our essences beautifully being dropped up there. Web blades are coming out. And the portals now do eventually destabilize, and we will have to watch out because they're going to leave behind gunk underneath them, and they're going to shoot out projectiles that one-shot you. So watch for those projectiles. They'll be coming always from behind you. After every portal set, there'll be projectiles coming from behind you. Uh, so yeah, dodging our web blades. And now we need to move our boss forward, and we're going to get another set of adds and another tank combo. Now here are those projectiles, by the way. Those one-shot you. Be very careful. Now, very soon, we are going to spawn four adds. And on, so four adds are going to spawn. We need to make sure that the four adds spawn forward rather than backwards. So the three adds will spawn like square, uh, circle, and then whatever's forward. Like these will basically always spawn, but we need to make sure that the fourth closest one is the one forward of us rather than the one behind us. So if the boss was spawning its acolytes right now, it would actually spawn a bad one back way behind us. So to guarantee this, after the infest comes out, I move the boss here such that it is forward of circle. It doesn't have to be forward by much, but as long as it, as if you drew a line from this inner point of the hexagon to this pillar, the boss needs to be in front of it. It needs to be clockwise of this so that it spawns the fourth acolyte also in front of rather than behind this line. Uh, meanwhile, again, we're spawning the adds and again, we're killing off these adds. This set, the warriors don't have as much for. Uh, so this set, we swap more range CDs onto. We use Ellie stuff to kill this set and uh, a couple of other 
you know, CDs go into this set uh, and people swap to them a little bit more aggressively. Also, web blades are coming soon. So we try and get them done as much as we can before the blades. And again, the same rules of baiting apply here where our ranged are baiting nice and disciplined along the edge here. And our melee are trying to bait kind of up and into the edge as well onto the ads rather than under the boss and forward. Uh, okay, so yeah, we swap to the ads. Uh, we kill these ones off. And then we're dodging the web blades again as well. This can be very hairy to dodge these in melee, but you only need a, a nice one nice little tight sliver and you're safe in there. So uh, yeah, you got a game. By this time, once you get to this phase, you'll have done enough web blades that you can hopefully game. Uh, okay, now here come the first shackles at the same time as the boss is spawning four acolytes. So these shackles uh, need to get taken. We take them on to circle and the rest of our raid actually retreats and we retreat the boss with us back to square. Uh, which is where the farthest back ad is spawning. Um, so yeah, we, we get these shackles. They go tight stack onto circle. Basically, you just stack right on top of each other on circle. Uh, we have an AMZ there, and uh, everybody else in the raid tries to get some distance because it's fall-off damage. They nerfed the damage of it by a lot, though, So you, you but you do still have to use defensives. This is where defensives are assigned. Um, so look at the logs, basically, of people doing this and of people your class doing this and figure out what defensives they pressed at what times there. This is basically where your defensives are assigned. And then health pot and health stone are kind of free to use in this phase uh, was basically how we handled this. Um, but yeah, this also will line up with the first set of null detonations casting, which is a lot of damage. So uh, yeah, here come those shackles. You can see people dropping very low, but not getting killed. And actually, nobody's even really in range where they'll die to four null detonation casts going off because they have their defensives rolling as well. Um, so yeah, meanwhile, we're killing off these adds kind of back to front and moving forward. Now we're moving the boss on top of the shackles, cleaving down four, three shackles and one add. It's very good that these shackles are tightly stacked so that we can just get them all killed. You don't want them loosely spread. These ones tight stack those shackles. It's way better. Uh, and then the Acolytes, again, their one cast actually went off that could have gotten kicked. You can see people dropping very low, so do kick the ones that you can. Uh, and again, as these die, make sure you don't stand on where their essence comes out. And we're just slowly moving the boss forward onto where all of these Acolytes live. Uh, and next, we're going to get another set of portals. Now, I, you'll notice earlier, replaced the markers as well. On this set, X can actually go on the inner ring of the, of the donut. And the, the triangle, again, goes forward up kind of where my marker is just off the screen there. Uh, and on this set, what we do is we just have both people who get targeted start running to green. And then our holy priest is standing on X and will choose one of them to life grip onto X. Uh, and that person will become the X portal. The other person is running out to green. When you drop this portal, you get knocked forwards. So if you're dropping X, don't look into the middle of the room because you will get knocked into the middle of the room and die. Uh, that's going to happen to somebody during your guild's progression of this, I promise you. Uh, okay, so we're finishing off the last Acolytes. Out come those portals. And you can see again pretty quickly, people are spreading there. We've got web blades happening as well. And our next set of essences are going to get picked up. Now, because we don't have to do the last set of essences, these essences leave a nasty dot, and we have to take seven of them through this portal because the three from the first set are permanent, and we're killing four more adds, so that's seven essences. So what we do for this set is we do two tanks, Four evokers who have Renewing Blaze, which is OP, and one mage are taking these. And because of that, everybody that's picking up an essence is indestructible. That's a benefit of doing it this way rather than like when Liquid did this, they had to do a lot sketchier on this set. And then they had a bunch of their evokers free to go on the last set. We can just overload the seven set with our most tanky people to the essences, which is Renewing Blaze evokers, tanks, a mage. Uh, and then we can have the last set just not happen, and we kill the boss before it happens. Uh, you should have the damage to do this if you're on this boss at this point, so I would definitely recommend at least using this strat or a variant of it. I'll discuss the other variant of it uh, at the very end of this. Um, so yeah, I'm picking up one of these essences. I'm picking up from the back of the square pile, so I just go around the other way, uh, pick one of these things up right around when the timer says to, and you can see all of our evokers going and grabbing them as well. And it's time to go through the last portal now. Uh, so again, all the Acolytes have to have died. Their essences have to be picked up. And we have to take them through this portal. If you are an essence person going into this portal, go in late. Go in like on zero. And if you're a non-essence person, go in on 0.5 or 1. Because as soon as somebody with an essence touches this portal, it's going to start the timer on when the portals explode. And it's fast. It's much faster than you'd think. Um, so you can see everybody getting ready here. The people over there are going to be using their own stuff to get over this. The people over here are all planning to take the portal. Uh, and... People are starting to take the portal. Point two, we have our first person going in. And then zero, we're all going in. And immediately the portals are now destabilizing because somebody with an essence has gone through, right? Um, so we have to get out of here quickly. We have Stampeding Roar going. Everybody is moving. All of our essence people are dropping. Now, our strat 
involves killing all five acolytes at the end. And then the enrage for us is the last Nova. Um, so the second to last Nova of the fight, not the one that Liquid beat, but the one that they did and then killed the boss. Um, so because of that, our enrage is defined by when that Nova will hit an essence. So we need to get these essences as close to the inner ring as possible uh, on this set. So all seven of our essence people are going to try and drop along the inner ring. And it's actually good if you can prefer the middle because of geometry. A circle will touch the points of the hexagon before it touches the middle of those line segments. So to the best you can, you're just trying to get them. And mostly just get them along the middle part of the room. If you have one essence dropped far out here, your enrage is 10 seconds less or five seconds less. So that is bad. I'm a tank, so I'm actually going to run into the gunk here to make more space for everybody else. The rule was everybody else is dropping between skull and circle. That's kind of there. Uh, place to drop these. So yeah, I get in here. Everybody's dropping our essence. You can see we've got them all pretty close to the inner part of the room. These two aren't great, but it's okay, right? Like as long as they're not out here, uh, we're pretty happy with them. We have a nice tight grouping of them. And this is our farthest out one. So this defines our enrage. Now, a bunch of other stuff's happening here as well. We had a couple people dying during this part as well. Uh, these projectiles are pretty lethal from the portal destabilizing. So that kills people here. Um, and also there's web blades and stuff that, that kill people in this time. So this is what your b are for. Try not to use b reses on the easier parts of the fight. Now on this set, we have our second set of shackles. Uh, and this one is lightly spread in an AMZ on the edge of the room over here. Uh, and these people, what we do is we set up a gateway from about here to over here. And the people who get targeted take the gateway and spread in this AMZ. So you want to basically spread so that you're in the corners of the AMZ, or, or everybody will be on the edge of the AMZ. Although actually post-nerf on the shackles fall-off damage, you could probably pixel stack these as well. Um, and then everybody else is just playing nice and far back from this, using a defensive if they need to to live this. Bang, out comes that damage. And now we have all of our... Yeah, you can see we actually tight stack them again now. So now that it's been nerfed, you can do that. Um, and we bring the boss on top of these. The reason we're doing this is because we're again going to get small ads spawning and we're going to spawn these small ads up over here. Uh, so it's time to do that now. So uh, we finish off these shackles as best we can. And then this is where we're going to lust. We're going to hit the lust basically as soon as these hatchlings finish spawning to help us accelerate into killing the hatchlings because we're going to we do shackles, hatchlings, shackles, acolytes. All of those have to die in this short window. So this is where we use our lust to make that happen. Um, you can use, you can hold the lust for a bit here if you want more boss damage, if you need more boss damage, if you have the hatchlings under control, but I would just use it, uh, especially because you probably have the damage to kill this boss by the time that you start getting here consistently, um, especially as Nerebar Finery starts picking up. Um, okay, so again, exact same thing as the start of the fight. We're spawning the, the adds over here, and the boss needs to be, by the time this, the next big ad spawn, it needs to be closer to diamond than to either of the other points so that the ad that doesn't spawn is across the room from us over on square. As so we bring the boss forward, uh, we're now spawning our hatchlings. Again, I'm giving a nice healthy bit of extra space. We're going to lose damage because of this, but we're going to reduce the chances of a hatchling running into the boss and killing it. And we think we have the damage, so we don't need to, to really min-max that. Um, and now here come web blades again. We're dodging these as we finish killing off these hatchlings. Uh, and we've got our lust going. Use our second pots on this. Uh, and here come the five big ads. So... We are spawning with Diamond, obviously, is the middle one. Now, when Liquid were doing this, they pulled the boss back to Skull, and they brought their shackles forward to Diamond, and they just had one Warlock basically killing off this far back one. Because we also had an Ellie Shaman, we said, eh, these back ones are going to die. Both of them are going to die. It's going to be fine. So we actually keep the boss here, and we have our shackles move forward to Moon instead. Um, this is also possible for us because we don't have to place the last portals. So this is another adjustment we made from the Liquid Strat. Uh, we kept the boss here. Shackles are going forward and tight stacking on Moon. We're cleaving down the one here on Diamond for free. And our ranged are going to take care of two at the back here. Largely our Destruction Warlock and our Elemental Shaman uh, are involved in that, in that process. Uh, and then again, we have this far forward one on Star that's going to get some casts for a little while. And that will be the last one we kill by moving the boss onto it eventually. Um, again here, just never pick up an essence at this point unless there's... If somebody happened to drop a bad one, somebody who doesn't have a debuff stack can move it in towards the middle. That's allowed. Um, but otherwise, try never to pick up an essence at this point. Uh, and here come the shackles. The shackles move forward onto the next add. Uh, AMZ back here. Defensives forward. All that kind of good stuff. And we move the boss forward. We've killed one essence or one acolyte already. We're still in lust here. We move the boss on top of these shackles in this ad. The back acolytes already have had their shields broken, so they're already getting kicked back there. Uh, and getting killed off. 
And now we move the boss onto this forward one. Again, we have a safe channel where you can stand without being in this gunk. That's why the first portal of the phase was here. We don't need that over here because we're not walking back there. So that's why the second portal got to be over here. Now, the next portals are going to come out. These just get out. Just don't cleave people. You, you pulse damage around you as you're dropping a portal. Just bring this portal out and away from the raid. Uh, so that's all you have to do if you get targeted by this one and you're using this strat. And again, we're killing off this last Acolyte. So what you could also do is just ignore the last Acolyte or two Acolytes, break their shields and kick them, and then just try and kill the boss before the ring cast finishes and it moves to the middle of the room. But with our strat here, we actually have enough time uh, or we, we get extra time, right? Not only do we get the full duration of this cast, because right now it would wipe us if there were any if there were any acolytes still alive. Now we also had enough damage that we could have just not killed that acolyte, and the extra damage would have probably killed the boss, right? So those are the trade-offs. Either of them are good strats. Uh, if you do it the other way, you get to place the first portal more towards the middle. You get to not care about where you drop the seven essences. If you do it our way, you get until the ring would hit an essence uh, as extra enrage time. So you get all of this extra time here, probably an extra seven or so seconds uh, before you would wipe and you kill the boss. And that's the end of the Queen Answerek encounter. Yeah, a little bit of a long guide. Um, if you have any questions, throw them in the comments. I'll try my best to answer them. Uh, it's, you know, it's something. If you stayed this whole time and, uh, you know, good luck with your guild out there. If you watch this, even though you have no intention of ever pulling this boss, thank you. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was entertaining. Um, one of the hardest bosses they've ever made, even after these nerfs. It's still really hard. I expect it'll get some more nerfs, even though there's also the stacking raid buff that will be further nerfing it because it's just so brutally hard. Don't beat yourself up. This fight's really, really tough. Uh, and again, I will put a pinned comment with any strategy adjustments based on the nerfs. Do let me know if you have any questions. Thanks so much for watching. See you in the next one. Bye.